Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here uh, today. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about emails and other born digital archives, and it's a huge question. So what I want to do is to break it down into three smaller questions. How do we preserve emails? How do we make them available? And how do we produce new knowledge based on these emails? So I started becoming interested in these questions when I was working at the John Rylands Research Institute, uh, which is part of the John Rylands Library in Manchester. And my background, I'm a publishing historian and a literary scholar. So I became very interested in the archive of Carcanet Press, you know, the leading poetry publisher. Um, Carcanet was founded in 1969 by Michael Schmidt, uh, who's still, uh, you know, very active today. Uh, and initially, Carcanet was based in Oxford, but then it moved to Manchester in 1972. And of course, it's still based in Manchester. So Carcanet has been associated with leading poets, including Ted Hughes and Elizabeth Jennings. Um, so the good thing with Carcanet, the Carcanet Press Archive, is that this archive is nearly complete, uh, which is quite rare for a publishing firm. Uh, but there are two big problems with this archival collection. The first problem is that the largest part of the Carcanet paper collection, so accession 3 to 24, is currently uncatalogued uh, and it's close to researchers. So that's the paper part of the collection, and then you have the born digital part of the collection, which is a dark archive. So it's close to researchers, uh, access is restricted to a small number of staff only. So my HRC project is about Carcanet Press and the problem of born digital records, uh, which is, of course, a much broader <coughs> problem. I mean, other institutions, including the British Library, the Cabinet Office, uh, the National Archives, well, they face exactly the same problems, you know, and, uh, of course, institutions in Scotland as well have exactly the same problem. How do we preserve those born digital records? How do we make them available? And how do we produce new knowledge based on these records. And these questions, if we uh, zoom out, you know, uh, we, we, we realize that these questions are part of a broader story, the story of the transition from print to digital. And this story started well. And it's often the case with revolutions, you know, they bring great expectations. In the 1990s, the digital revolution was associated with a bright future. If you're over than 35 years old, well, you probably remember the first time you created an email account with Hotmail or Yahoo. Perhaps you even remember the first time you sent an electronic message. And for those of us who grew up with print, well, emails seemed full of promise. So much more convenient than print, cheaper than the telephone, no need to go to the post office to buy a stamp, and of course you could get a response almost instantly. You could even meet new people via email. And I don't know if you remember the romantic comedy You've Got Mail, you know, with Tom <laughs> Hanks and Meg Ryan. Well, it was released in 1998. And the two protagonists, they work in the book world. You know, they do not know each other at first. And they communicate only via emails. And in a way, this film is about the transition from print to digital. You've got mail, which is also the sound of email arriving, you know, for AOL users. Well, this sound reached the public consciousness. Print was out, the digital was in. So this story started well, but then problems started to appear. And more and more people started using emails and archivists began to worry because electronic records, of course, are extremely fragile. You can leave a letter in a box for several decades and there is a good chance that it will still be there when you open the box again. But the same is not true for emails and born digital records. Because, of course, formats and technologies change rapidly and if you leave electronic documents untouched for just a few years, well, the risk is that they will become unreadable. And, of course, this is not a new problem, but archivists are still struggling with that. In 2010, the American Library Community, OCLC, issued a report that said management of born digital archival materials is still in its infancy. 
And the sad news is that little progress has been made in the past eight years. That even when digital archives are actively preserved, they are often closed to researchers due to data protection and other issues. And of course, archivists talk of dark archives closed to researchers. There are three main reasons for closing email archives privacy concerns, copyrights, uh, and technical issues. And of course, you know, we've been uh, um, you know, uh, saying quite a lot of things about copyright today, but I want to, to add a little bit uh, of information here. So the first point is about privacy concerns. I mean, obviously, British and European institutions need to comply with the GDPR. And what happens is that repositories often prefer to restrict access instead of sharing potentially confidential documents. The US has a totally different approach to privacy. Obviously, you know, the legal context is totally different as well. And what happens is that American archivists will often have you sign some paperwork to make sure that if you find anything sensitive, well, you know, you will refrain from publishing it without permission. So, in a way, researchers are treated as responsible adults. But again, you know, the legal framework is totally different. So the second issue is copyright. Uh, even when an institution wants to share digital files, you know, it cannot put everything online for copyright reasons. Researchers still need to travel to archival repositories to consult documents. Uh, and of course, finally, there are technical issues. A few institutions have solved all the technical issues specific to digital archives, uh, including designing an appropriate interface to make these documents available to researchers. Uh, so, as we have seen, uh, born digital records are extremely fragile. It's especially true of emails, of digital correspondence. These documents are at risk of disappearing for three main reasons. The first one is that commercial providers can close down, uh, which leads to, to the deletion of millions of emails in certain situations. Perhaps you remember the, the example of Alta Vista, an early provider of emails. Uh, what happened is that it did not survive and it caused great losses of email content. Um, and of course, files uh, downloaded on personal computers can become unreadable over time. And finally, external storage can become obsolete. Um, so a couple of years ago, I came across the Calculate Press Email Preservation Project, uh, which was funded by GISC. And it was a great project. I mean, it led to the successful rescue and preservation of 215,000 emails and 65,000 attachments uh, uh, generated by Carcanet Press, so emails sent by Michael Schmidt, for example, the founder. And this project won uh, the prestigious uh, Safeguarding the Digital Legacy Award uh, awarded by the DPC, the Digital Preservation Coalition. So, as I said, preserving email collection is not a new problem. You know, it started in the 1990s following an important legal case. In August 1993, a US Court of Appeals decided that federal agencies, you know, like the White House, the Congress, must retain all official emails that exist within their computer systems. So basically, it was not enough to print certain messages out to paper, the court said. You know, hard copies often lacked important information. Who sent the message? To whom? What time was it sent? So electronic versions had to be retained to satisfy record keeping requirements. And of course, for archivists, that was a major challenge, uh, as this article published in 1994 uh, shows. So, of course, in the past 25 years, uh, several scandals have shown the historical and legal value of emails. Uh, I'm sure you remember the Enron scandal, the WikiLeaks scandal, the ClimateGate scandal, and more recently, uh, the scandal with uh, the emails of Hillary Clinton. So, again and again, we've seen uh, the devastating impact of information or perceived information contained in email correspondence. But many archivists still you know, are not sure what to do with born digital records, and the issue of preservation remains a central problem. And again, you know, as a researcher, I would say that preserving email collections is one thing, but making them accessible is another. 
So um, the Karaoke Entertainment Collection, as I told you, is still being treated as a dark archive, embargo to researchers. So access is restricted to a small number of staff only. So I want to, um, to talk a little bit about another case study, the Harry Ransom Center in Austin, Texas. So two years ago, I was the first caller to access the uh, emails uh, of Ian McEwen. Um, and um, basically, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this collection. So what happened is that a couple of years ago, Stephen Ennis, who's the director of the Harry Ransom Center, he traveled to London and he met with Ian McEwen, you know, to discuss the acquisition of this collection. And Ennis was really interested in the correspondence between Ian McEwen and Salman Rushdie. So basically, he convinced Ian McEwen to, uh, to include his emails as part of this collection. So basically, uh, McEwen agreed, and when he sold his archive to the Harry Ransom Center, well, he included 17 years of emails from 1997 to 2014. And not many people know about these emails. You know, what the finding it does tell us is that there are email printouts available to researchers. And of course, these printouts are just a small selection of McEwen's 80,000 emails. So it's quite ironic that literary archives still rely on prints at a time when most records are born digital. So that was the first example I wanted to show. The second <coughs> example is um, the Salman Rushdie Archive at Emory University in Atlanta. Um, so when Salman Rushdie transferred his archive to Emory, he included an early Macintosh, and visitors cannot use this old machine, but they have access to an emulator. So they can see what was on Rushdie's desktop on the last day that he typed at the machine. And there was an interesting article in the New Yorker um, that said that the experience of you know, using this early computer environment can inspire a sort of nostalgia, you know, especially for people who remember their first uh, computer. Um, so that was quite interesting. Going back to my um, example on Karakinet Press, you know, last year I started my HRC Leadership Fellowship. The title of the project is quite long. It's Survival of the Weakest, Preserving and Analyzing Born Digital Records to Understand How Small Poetry Publishers Survive in the Global Marketplace. <coughs> So as I said, the project focuses on small poetry publishers, particularly on Karakinet Press. And I have two central objectives. Uh, the first one is to make publishers' archives more accessible. And the second objective is to write the first history of Karakinet Press, because of course this publishing house has been central to the contemporary literary marketplace. Mm. So as you can see, the second objective is very much traditional publishing history. Um, so in the case of the Karakinet Press Archive, I want to create a digital resource that makes selected emails from this archive available to a wide range of users. <laughs> And I hope that this model could be applied to other born digital archives in the UK and elsewhere. So what is the objective? Well, the digital resource will offer a user-friendly way to discover new and previously inaccessible materials <coughs> related to Karakanet Press at the John Wyland's Library. And of course, once these materials are discovered, this can lead to groundbreaking knowledge. So if we look at this interesting report published in uh, 2014, the authors wrote, as custodians of digital content, we need to think more from the researcher's point of view and less like curators. People come looking for resources in ways we often haven't even imagined. So basically, the project's digital resource will offer a model, you know, again, you know, that will improve the findability and usability of those um, born digital collections. And it will incorporate four elements, four main elements. So the first one will be recording as, uh, recordings of the oral history interviews uh, uh, that I'm doing you know, as PI and also with my project archivist. Uh, we will have a selection of 100 emails produced by Karkanet, as well as data visualizations you know, based on this digital archive. We'll have web pages containing information about the newly catalogued paper archive, uh, looking particularly at Ted Hughes and Elizabeth Jennings, because obviously those writers you know, are well known outside academia as well as within academia. 
And finally, we'll have early versions of workshop and conference papers, uh, which, you know, we are also planning a special issue of a journal. So the digital resource will open the door to materials that did not previously exist, for example, the recordings of oral history interviews, or also to materials inaccessible to researchers. I'm thinking, of course, of the Carl Kennett emails and also of the formerly uncatalogued paper uh, records. Um, so, briefly, I'm facing several obstacles to create this digital resource. The first one is a question of permissions, because of course, you know, especially in the case of emails that are created by Michael Schmidt, uh, of course, you know, he has concerns about what kind of materials might contain confidential or sensitive information. And there is also the issue of uh, <coughs> getting permissions from third parties. So permission, that's the first obstacle. The second obstacle is uh, the policy of the John Rylance Library. I mean, of, of course, you know, they need to deal with uh, the GDPR um, and it's complicated, obviously. So what will happen is that my digital archivist will read a selection of 100 emails. She will get approval from Michael Schmidt and then these emails will be made available on the digital resource. So I think it's a good starting point, basically. Um, and finally, another obstacle is the technical infrastructure, you know, to display these emails. So at the moment, we are thinking of something quite low-key, you know, just uh, using PDFs as an opportunity to search within these documents. Okay, so I give you the example of the Ian McEwen collection at the Harry Ransom Center, the Salman Rushdie collection at Emory University, and the Carl Kennett Press Archive at the John Rylance Library. And I think these examples of born digital collections offer three valuable lessons to solve the problem of preservation and access. The first, um, the first lesson is that contemporary archives, whether paper or digital, will always carry some risk regarding data protection. So when I was looking at uh, Ian McEwan's emails, I discovered some confidential and sensitive information. And I think, you know, uh, most researchers will not publish this kind of stuff, okay? We have this, uh, this kind of unwritten ethical code, you know, we're not going to publish anything sensitive or confidential. And of course, our archives can also ask researchers to sign, you know, documents, you know, uh, asking researchers not to publish anything which might be problematic. The second lesson is that the technical infrastructure does not need to be perfect. For the McEwen archive, I was not sure if the emails I was reading on the screen were originally in the inbox folder, in the send folder, or in another folder. So often it was difficult to understand the context. And actually a typical experience was to read McEwen's response to a query, and then you know, I clicked several dozens of other emails, and finally I found the, the original question. So I think, you know, the small technical problems did not prevent me from finding relevant data for my research. Um, and finally, the third lesson is that archival institutions should actively involve researchers at the early stage of opening uh, born digital collections. Um, and we've been, uh, you know, talking quite a lot about, you know, working closely between uh, libraries and researchers. And I think that's really moving in the right direction here. At the Harry Ransom Center, for example, Stephen Ennis um, asked me to, to give him some feedback on my experience of using McEwen's uh, email archive. Um, and also, I think this empowers researchers to play an active role in shaping access to these collections, uh, rather than you know, passively waiting for archivists to give us finding gates uh, um, or to design access policies. So, in other words, researchers can be co-creators of archives instead of passive users. Okay, so I'm going to conclude now. Um, you know, at, at first, you know, this talk started with a, a call for action. Born digital archives are endangered archives, and we need to preserve these collections to make them available and to produce new knowledge. So the good news is that some progress has been made since 2003 when UNESCO warned that the world digital heritage was rapidly disappearing. Uh, you have institutions such as the BNF in France that are actively preserving web archives. Of course, the British Library is doing the same thing. So that's you know, moving in the right direction. Uh, public organizations and universities are you know, uh, doing a lot of work, but they are moving quite slowly. Uh, and I think it's quite a pity 
is that email and born digital archives are still treated as a new thing that you know um, not many people understand basically and if you look at um, a, a survey uh, that was published in 2016 uh, it was commissioned by Archivum, a provider of data safeguarding solutions so what they did they conducted a survey among professionals in a wide range of galleries museums archives libraries and when they asked people about their digital preservation strategy, well, 67% responded that they were still at the information gathering just starting out phase. And only 30% had a process in place and were actively doing digital preservation. So you have a slow rate of progress on the one side, and of course on the other side we have those internet giants, you know, Facebook, Twitter, etc., uh, move fast and break things. So you know that's totally uh, different here. So I think it's important that we accelerate the, the, the rate here, you know, that we are, um, accelerate the preservation of born digital literary archives. Um, and we also need as researchers to push for access uh, to these archives through open data, but open data respectful of privacy. So that's a fine balance really. And just one final point, uh, um, I think we need to adapt to a changing world uh, where print is the exception rather than the norm. This is what Meg Ryan's character says in You've Got Mail. <laughs> People are always saying that change is a good thing, but all they're really saying is that something you didn't want to happen at all has happened. And you know, perhaps we didn't choose this transition from print to digital. I mean, many of us would prefer to shop at a, you know, a lovely local bookshop instead of you know, using Amazon. So we didn't really choose this transition, but the transition from print to digital is of course all a source of opportunities. <coughs> so I think it's really urgent to preserve those born digital documents, to make them available and to produce new knowledge. And I'm organizing a big conference next year uh, in London on archives access and the AI. I have a call for papers at the moment on the website Poetry Survival. The deadline is on the 1st of June. If you want to send us a proposal, that would be absolutely great. Thank you so much for listening. Thank <laughs> you.